Welcome to Everyone Loves Guitar, where we sit down and talk with interesting professional guitar players, uncover their stories, and discover what makes them tick. If you love guitar, music, and the backstory of people's lives, stick around. You're in the right place. Hi, this is Craig. Just want to let you know you can now advertise here on Everyone Loves Guitar podcast. For more information, go to everyonelovesguitar.com forward slash advertise. That's everyonelovesguitar.com forward slash advertise. Hey, everybody. This is Craig Garber. Welcome to Everyone Loves Guitar. I'm with the one and only Ken Andrews today. Ken is best known as co-founder, lead vocalist, guitarist, bassist, and co-songwriter of the alternative rock band Failure. He's also played in The Replicants, which is a cover band and side project that includes members of Tool. After putting out three great LPs in the early to mid-90s, Failure broke up. At that point, Ken recorded music under the moniker On, O-N, assembled and fronted the band Year of the Rabbit, and performed in various solo projects, including one with Charlotte Martin, who Ken married in 2005. He's also a successful mixing engineer. He's done work for Nine Inch Nails, Beck, A Perfect Circle, Tenacious D, Candlebox, and others. And he co-produced the 2006 James Bond movie theme song for Casino Royale, the song which, as you know my name, was performed by Chris Cornell. Great freaking song that was, man. In 2007, Ken released a solo album, and in 2014, the members of Failure reunited for the 50th birthday celebration for Tool's frontman, Maynard James Keenan. Since then, Failure's released three new records, including the one that's out just now. It's called In the Future, Your Body Will Be the Furthest Thing from Your Mind, and that came out November 2018. Ken, thanks so much for your time, man. Hey, thank you for having me. You're welcome, man. I um, It's funny. I I, I really love love your voice, man, to be honest with you. You know, as a I don't usually your your voice is incredibly moving, man. I, I don't know like if has that always been a thing of yours, but just for whatever that's worth, man, I really Oh, thank you. No, I mean I actually don't uh I, you know, some people some some people say nice things about my singing voice. Uh <laughs> <laughs> uh you know, I don't know. It's just something I've uh, uh, done since the beginning. And, you know, my interest in music was early on was very songwriting oriented. So, um, you know, I just kind of gravitated towards singing and, 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 and writing lyrics and stuff really early on. Yeah. Well, your voice is like an instrument, man. I thought it was wonderful. Um, and let's talk about the, the latest record because I really enjoyed it. And again, it's called, I'm going to ask you about the title, which I never usually do, but in the future, your body will be the furthest thing from your mind. It's got great catchy melodies. I, I found the whole thing is kind of like Beatles-like as far as the structure of the melodies. Great vocals at the same time. At the same time, it had that really cool spacey and underground alt vibe. You originally released that as, released this record as four separate EPs and then is one full length 16 track LP once the individual EPs were done. What was the, like what prompted you guys to do that? Um, there was a few different reasons for that. One, uh, I was kind of, I was just in a spot personally uh, where I didn't want to commit to doing a full album. I didn't know what was going on with my uh, personal life at that point. I didn't know what was happening with my my uh, my main you know my main uh, job, as it were, is uh, is mixing for other bands, um, and you know failure is something I do. It failure takes up a lot of my time when we're actually working, so I, I wouldn't say it's like a side project for me. It's 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 pretty much my main project outside of mixing. Um, but there was just a lot going down with uh, records I was mixing, and I couldn't see a, a scenario of of spending six straight months making a new failure record at that point. And it was just a lot of upheaval, upheaval in my life. And 
you know, I just said, why don't we do an EP? Why don't we just do an EP and just get kind of get our confidence back up or get my confidence back up uh, in terms of just creating new material. And then it was kind of as we were starting to do that EP, it was like, or as we maybe as we were like halfway, it was like, oh, we can, this is not so bad. Like biting off a smaller piece is, is not as scary. Um, why don't we just do another EP? And then it became like, oh, well, aren't we really, aren't, isn't what we're really doing making an album here? We're just kind of doing it more broken up. Uh, and then it was like, well, maybe it would be cool for fans to get some music uh instead of having to wait another year and a half maybe they could it'd be cool for them because it had already been a year and a half since the last album the heart is a monster had come out so it's just kind of a confluence of a, a few different factors um some of it definitely uh, coming from kind of insecurity and just uh, a, a certain amount of uh just not knowing what was going to be going on. Um, but it, you know, as it turned out, we basically kept the flow going. We had some, you know, breaks here and there, but we basically kept the flow going for the better part of a year and, you know, um, released the three EPs. And then we just worked on maybe four more songs and all of a sudden we had an album. Did everything have a happy ending? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, good. Yeah. Man. <laughs> yeah. Um, as I said, your voice is really great, man. I'm not like being a fanboy, but as just it's it's really enjoyable. Do you look at yourself as a vocalist who happens to be a multi instrumentalist, or a multi instrumentalist who happens to sing, or like, or neither? Um, I think I I look at myself as just kind of a um. A, a studio creator maybe um you know my my experience with being in a band is you know i started i started playing guitar when i was 18 which is kind of old yeah um uh and i got right right away i got interested in trying to write songs i i never went down the path of actually becoming a good guitar player. Um, I, as soon as I could string a few chords together, I was trying to construct song ideas. Um, they weren't very good for a while, but um, eventually I got to the point where I had a four track, cassette four track. I had a guitar, I had a bass, I had a guitar amp, and I had a 58. Uh, microphone and oh and i had a really i can't re uh, yamaha drum machine i can't remember the model number um and with those tools i i basically started making four track demos of songs that had started to have like a real character to them and kind of kind of a vibe and and you know they were they were pretty dark i was listening to a lot of mid-period cure hmm. Uh, which was very, very dark pornography and faith. Those those albums were um, really influential to to me early on while I was in college. Um, and all of a sudden, I had like three or four songs that I had finished um, using this four track that I thought were pretty cool. And so I started playing them for some of my friends, and I played I played them for a friend who was a drummer and he was like, this is really cool. We should use these as kind of like a jumping off point for a band. And I was like, Oh, a band. Okay. Um, so the two, he and I started looking for a bass player. We were both in college at the time. Where was this? So we did, uh, I, I went to Cal state LA here in, in Los Angeles, uh, studied, uh, film and, and television. Um, and, uh, he, we looked for a bass player for basically a year and a half. It wasn't wow. like the high, it wasn't a high priority. We were like, okay, yeah, the idea of a band sounds cool, but we got to find the right person or it's not going to be fun. 
and it took us a long time and we we basically were using ads in the recycler and maybe music connection i think which is a local music magazine with a lot of ads in the back personal ads for looking for you know band looking for bassist or or bassist looking for band kind of thing and we've stumbled upon greg edwards that's how we um, he, he, something about the ad caught his eye and he actually called me, we ended up meeting and we, I think he was the only person that we actually auditioned or played together with and it kind of clicked and that's how the band got started. Wow. That would have been, that would have been 89. But you, it almost was like an afterthought. Sound, it sounded like how you like being like getting a band, which is unusual. Most well, people are like, yeah, man, let's get a band together. I mean, I was interested and I was into it, but I, at the same time, I was taking like 26 units trying to graduate from college. Right. And I was doing a lot of production work uh, in video world oh, okay. uh, through projects in school um, and, and then what actually ended up happening is I, I was following a few local bands that I thought were cool. So I was going out to local clubs and seeing what it, that whole scene was like thinking, yeah, eventually I'm going to maybe have a band of my own and I want to know what, you know, what it looks, what it looks like to be playing out in LA. So I was going to shows, watching bands and I met a band I saw a band and introduced myself to this band that I really loved. I saw I saw it multiple times. Um, they were called Block B L O C, a female um, singer and two guitar players, bass player and drummer, and they were just a really cool, interesting uh, band. And I asked them if I could make a video for them hmm. for part of my. Um, school projects that I had to turn in and I ended up making two videos for them. One of the videos though, um, the see, this was like 88, 89. So it, I, back then MTV had a, um, had a show called the MTV basement tapes. And it was basically the only way an unsigned band or music group or something could get a video played on MTV. And MTV was at the time a big deal. It was the national sure. radio station. Um, so I submitted this video that I had done for my classwork and it ended up winning um, the MTV basement tapes for that month. Oh, that's basically cool. what it was. Basically what it was is MTV curated like four videos out of all their submissions and they played those videos a couple times on the sh on the basement tape show, and they flashed a one nine hundred number. And so basically, the country voted on on what their favorite video was, and and the video I did won. And the and the the prize I believe for winning was the band got a bunch of music gear. And maybe a chance to play for labels or something. And the video, but the video got medium rotation for a month. Oh, that was cool. Which which was actually really cool. Yeah. Really cool for a band to get, like, to just be in the playlist of, of MTV. So all of a sudden I had a video on MTV and I was still in school. I was... It was like the beginning of winter semester, basically, of my last year in school. And I started getting work as a video director. Um, because of that opportunity created. For yes. You. What was the cool thing about the video that won it, in your opinion? Um, the, well, the, the band was cool. The okay. band was really cool. Great singer. Interesting sound. Not uh, They were original sounding band. They didn't really sound like anyone. I mean... Looking back, they it was, they sort of proceeded. They had a little bit of like maybe a Sugar Cubes vibe, hmm. but be way before Sugar Cubes. <laughs> um, so I don't know. I just thought they were really interesting. Like the music sometimes would touch on like a Peter Gabriel type thing. The bass player was playing like a six string bass 
lots of really and really it was almost proggy this was sounds in a way yeah. but 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 the songs the instrumentation was really kind of challenging and kind of like one of the guitar players sort of sounded like adrian Ballou a little bit uh but the the songs were actually grounded in in pop songwriting you know they yeah. had and the arrangements were were kind of normal um but uh th- i did a couple techniques in the video that i don't think anyone had really done before um visual techniques and i think that's what kind of made the video pop out a little bit to mtv um it's kind of hard to explain uh, uh without showing it but <laughs> there was just a couple things i did i shot it on film and at the time the way that people made videos is you would shoot on film because video cameras at the time didn't look cinematic yeah. enough you yeah, really had to shoot yet. film yeah they weren't there yet they looked like tv news so i rented i went i rented a real film camera shot film but then you have to in order to edit and then deliver or show people stuff you have to transfer the film to tape and edit on videotape and then finish um so there's this process called telecine where you transfer the film to to tape and during the telecine session which i paid for which cost like 300 bucks or something i noticed when they were rewinding the film and fast forwarding it um that it just looked really cool like what was happening on the screen but no one ever used like that was just, that's just like something you wouldn't see. Right. It mm-hmm. was like that was just a in between. You'd set the color. They would play playing the film. They'd set the color and then they'd go back and actually lay it off to tape. And I was like, wait, can you just record some of that stuff where you're like rewinding and fast forwarding and slowing down and stuff? And they, he was like, OK, sure. I mean, I guess I guess we could do that. And so we did that. And then I started figuring out that there was a whole bunch of, there was basically a camera looking at the film, a video camera, really high quality video. And you could do, you could mess with that camera and do a lot of cool stuff. So I started zooming in on the film and making it really grainy and kind of, and I almost, I stopped the film once and it burned out, uh, you know, it melted on the, (laughs) on the lamp and that was cool. And which everyone's seen that, but like, you know, there was other things you could do basically. And so my whole video ended up being this kind of like, uh, deconstruction of film yeah. kind of visually. And it was, you know, it caught a few people's eyes and, it, and, uh, I started getting work as a, as a video director. So I kind of thought that's where my career was going because actually before I even graduated from Cal State LA, I was making a pretty good living doing, directing music videos and but i had this i had this band concept kind of on the side and i Mm. was enjoying doing that too we started finally started playing shows you know we played our first show at al's bar and in in hollywood and and i think there was maybe eight people there having drinks listening and or not really listening but then after like a few months we noticed people, some people started coming back and actually Ah, coming to see us again. And they weren't our friends, which, you know, a lot of bands starting out, at least at that point, it's like, yeah, okay. You start out, your friends come to the first few shows and support you. Right. And then, then you really see if anyone likes your music. (laughs) Yeah. Fly (laughs) little butterfly. Yeah. Yeah. Push the bird out of the nest. And our drummer had a really good idea, uh, which was let's put he he was really tapped into the whole college radio scene at the time. And he uh, he said, you know, there's this whole scene in college radio where indie bands make seven inch, a seven inch single, you know, double sided single. And you just send it out to college stations and see if they play it. And, there, you know, there's no payola there's no you don't have to go through the whole you know Mm -hmm. thing of commercial radio and it was relatively cheap we managed to do the whole thing recording and pressing for under 500 bucks 
Wow. So, that is yeah, really. Re- well, we were only made like a hundred copies, though. Yeah, I mean, but it was still. like, yeah. Well, we you know we found like a, a studio at a garage somewhere. You know what we were we were using the cheapest things we could find. Basically, we didn't really have good equipment, good drums yet, or anything. But you know, we had some ideas, and we we recorded these seven inches and we did we sent them out we mailed them a kind of across the country and we ended it ended up charting on the cmj uh cause music journal awesome. but more importantly kxlu here in los angeles the um co- the true college radio station out of loyola marymount university started playing it and they played it during the day uh, and during drive time and stuff. And all of a sudden our, sh- our shows went from, you know, 40 people to like two, 300 people pretty quickly. That's cr- And, you know, then they, it kept growing a little bit more. And then, uh, all of a sudden we had record labels showing up and then, but I, I was in the thick of, you know, doing music videos and, th- and then all of a sudden I was kind of in, in, I guess it would have been, uh, Late 89, I was basically pre- presented with this choice of like, do I stay in, in Hollywood and keep doing music videos or do I sign this record contract with Slash Records and get in a van and tour the country, basically, uh, as an indie rock band? And uh, much to the disappointment of my parents, I signed the the record contract. What was, what was the trigger the there? What was the trigger? Uh, the trigger to do it. Yeah. Like what, put, why did you sign the contract instead of staying in the, you know, you had a, what by all means appeared to be on track for a, a very successful career as a video director. Um, t- I would say two, two main reasons. Um, one was, I mean, if someone is giving you money to make, to make music, it's pretty hard to turn it down. I mean, cause even though I was enjoying doing the video stuff, it's not quite as enjoyable as writing songs and playing live and playing guitar. And you know that, I mean, it's just, that was a little, but I always considered the music thing more of a hobby and, or maybe a fantasy in a way, you know, like to be able to have a career to do it didn't okay. seem realistic to me. But then when we had Slash to Records saying, hey, we're going to give you $50,000 to go make a record. Um, and we've got, you know, we're going to give you at least that in tour support to go support it. Yeah. It was like, well, you know, it, it, then it was kind of also like, if I turn this down, I'll probably never get this chance again. Uh, And maybe, you know, the video stuff will still be there. You know, I don't know. I didn't really know. Then the, uh, there was one other little thing that was really bugging me about the video stuff. And that was that through a kind of confluence of strange things that happened, I was getting to be known as a hip hop video director, if you can believe that. Uh, Because hip hop videos at the time were just blowing up. Basically, if you rapped, you got a record deal. And <laughs> has that changed? And, <laughs> yeah, I don't. I know. I, I do because you have to be good now. I think. I mean, you have to like. I think there was a lot of kind of mediocre talent in the beginning in in hip hop world getting signed, right? Just because the labels didn't really understand the genre, they were just like it's selling we let's sign yeah. anyone basically it's like buying real estate when the market's going nuts people just get in there and buy anything and like it's gonna grow up yeah i get it man yeah so um and i was i was frustrated by that i kept telling in my video reps i want to do i want to be making videos for sonic youth and they were like who's sonic youth you know <laughs> <laughs> um so there was a kind of a disconnect there yeah. and so, um yeah so so, so i got uh, in the van and that and that was basic we got in the van in 1990 and um you know i've been in the music business ever since i never really went back 
full fledged into video. Yeah. Although some people knew that I did video stuff in the past, so I did. I I've dabbled since then. I've done. I've directed and you know edited most of the failure videos. Um, I've I edited one of the tool videos um, back in the nineties. Um, you know, I still dabble in that a little bit, but like for the most part, I've, um, you know, I've had a career in, in the music business and stuff. So a few questions for you. So it seems like you had these two passions, but the, the music road as it was presented versus the video road as it was presented at that time would have allowed you to fulfill that passion with probably a little more integrity. Um, y yeah, 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 I would say so. Well, it was my own, you know, it was my, well, the band's material. Yeah. So, you know, I just figured it, it was, it was an opportunity that, you know, not a lot of people get, Oh hell no. you know, yeah. some, someone to say, we're going to finance your art, right? Your, your specific, your individual art, at least for a while yeah. and see if it works. And so I, t I took that chance, but you know, I definitely took a hit financially. That's for sure. Yeah. Yeah. The other question I had, you mentioned, uh, which was funny at the time you said MTV was the America's, we said radio station or video channel. What National you, radio station. Now like I, radio one is in, in the UK in BBC in, uh, yeah, in the UK. So I guess YouTube is, that is, a, is our mm -hmm. rational radio station now if if someone wanted to go on and look at the block video that you did is that on youtube if someone wants to check that i out? think so it's called the title of the song is not a secret dance not a secret dance and the band is yeah. block b-l-o-c yeah that's the award-winning uh video well cool man i mean it's by today's standards it's gonna look of course man pretty primitive but uh you know, at the time it was, it was kind of cool. Yeah. And it was cool to be in school, still be in college and have your work on. Hell television. yeah. Definitely. You know? And man. I could send, I had a reel that had that video on it and people would put it in and go, Oh yeah, I've seen this one. Yeah. Yeah. That you was know, probably so a great that, like resume. You know, mm -hmm. that, that was your business card at that point. You know, that video That was my card for yeah, sure. That was great. You know, I, I never, I like very, very, very rarely ask about names of any things because like everybody does that. Um, but in the future, your body will be the furthest thing from your mind is a really cool title. So I just wanted to know like what was behind it. I'm going to have to uh, defer on that one only because I didn't come up with it. That's Greg. Okay. That is all Greg. Um, and to be honest, I've never really queried him on it. I just loved when he said said it to me i was like that's it yeah it's, it's, it, it, it's it's interesting it has like a flow to it it makes you think about things um and you know uh, the one thing that i do know about it is that it it connects to one of the themes that we deal with in a few songs about the sort of depersonalization and the, and the disconnect that we're all going through with technology right now yeah so if it does relate to anything, I think it relates to that. Thanks, man. And I also, the other reason I like it is, you know, uh, conventional like advertising wisdom or whatever would always tell you, you know, keep things short. This is like 13 words, which if you said that, I have a 13 word song, album title, whatever, people would be like, oh, no, 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 no. But I like shit that goes against conventional wisdom, especially that works and sounds good like this does. Um, yeah, well, the cool thing about what we're doing right now is we have no one to answer to. We have no, you know, we're our own label. Yeah. Um, and it's just, you can just do whatever you want. That was another thing that I, I found inspirational about doing the, the EPs as opposed to waiting and doing the whole album is that we got feedback from our fans yeah. while we were working, which was, you know, that's cool. very, yeah. Well, it's a great test if it's not working, you know, to, you know, to make an adjustment right away, which is mm -hmm. like, how often do you get that feedback after, you know, in, in intermediate, you know, steps like that? Yeah. Yeah. A couple of the tracks I just want to talk about. Uh, 
Mm-hmm. I, I liked I liked the whole record, but these two in particular, no one left. I, it was like an old uh, old school, like a dance groove stuff, but kind of like XTC, which you know the alt hardcore thing, bass mm-hmm. thumping away. You you have these really cool harmonics sort of sounds on the bass, man. And I was curious what what did you do to get those sounds? Um, well, one thing that we have sort of grav- gravitated to over the years is a bass sound that is pretty distorted. Um, and I think that comes out of being a trio, um, in the sense that as time has gone on, I think we've kind of realized what's, what's happening instrumentation wise is that we're kind of letting the bass cover not only the, you know, what bass normally does, which is the low end and the fundamental of the chord. Um, but also it's covering frequencies that are up higher where maybe rhythm guitar would be. Hmm. So yeah, it's a- almost like to create a kind of full sound, full heavy sound out of a trio, we're we're doing a lot of chords on the bass, and we're and the sound is pretty distorted, yes, and very full. And so it's got a top end to it, kind of, and and then the guitar is getting more. Um, more riffy and a lot more high, like sort of bright spiky sounds that are more in contrast with the bass sound. But the end result is you kind of get, you're kind of filled in a lot of frequencies basically. Hmm. Um, so yeah, I mean, that's kind of, that's what, that's one of the, I think hallmarks of the band sound. So are you getting those harmonics? It's the same way you get a harmonic on a guitar. Well, I'm not sure what you mean by harmonic. What do you mean? Like it sounded like, like, you know, when you play, like, you know, take the edge of the pick and, you know, you create a harmonic sound on a guitar. Oh, like a pinched harmonic? Correct. When you, when like, you pick right. Hard? Pinched harmonics. Right. And yeah. and it's, it kind of had those sounds with the bass. I was like, man, that sounds really cool. Oh, are you talking about no one left? Are you talking about like in the, does, is, is the verse of that song have guitar that is being strummed behind the nut is that what you're hearing maybe Shing, like really chimey i thought it was the bass it could you be the, it bass. yeah i'm pretty okay. sure it was bass because it was it was now that's interesting i wonder if it wasn't even ba- i i'm pretty sure it was bass coming up with that it sounded funky as hell man you want to play it, it weird if i just <laughs> played no, it really no quick? man do your thing it won't be weird at all do whatever you want man this is i got it right here i'm like you i don't have anybody to answer to <laughs> no no one left right That's what you're yeah no one left oh oh like those harmonics right there i can't Can you hear, hear that i can't hear what you're hearing okay but it's throughout the song and i'm pretty sure it's coming from the bass yeah i think it's actually coming from the guitar really yeah i'm pretty sure that's what i mean it, if you played it there, or if there was a way we could hear it together, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I could say, you know, is it this? Um, but yeah, there's what's going on there because the bass is really just playing um, single notes. It's like a three note progression. Dun, 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 just hanging on that note. There's nothing, it's a, an overdriven bass sound. Yeah. But the guitar is doing something pretty, pretty weird where uh, Greg is actually playing behind the nut at yeah. the top of the, by where the machine heads are. You know, he's, he's playing, str- he's playing a look, li- he's knocking out a bass, a melody there basically. Yeah. Um, and then later starts, you know, playing fretted notes. That's in, interesting. In man. It sounded just yeah. like, that's cool. Very cool. Thank you for uh, explaining that. Cause I was curious about that. Mm-hmm. And then, um, the other song I like, uh, Found a Way, you know, total explosion of sound and, um, you know, followed by some really nice quiet. But the lyrics, find a way, finally found a way to release you. Is that like about a toxic relationship? Yeah, basically. Yeah. Yeah, yeah definitely. Did, it was pretty. 
pretty cool, man. Lot, you know, very well done. Well, well done communicated, man. That was good. And uh, those vocals are awesome again. Thank you. I know this has been discussed a hundred times, but for my listeners who haven't heard the story, there was a 19 year gap between 96, 1996, Fantastic Planet, and then 2015, The Heart is a Monster. What happened and what changed without like getting all gossipy and shit? Um, what mm-hmm. changed to allow you and Greg to to reconcile and get back together and do this again? Mm-hmm. Uh, well, the band, uh, you know, I broke the band up in September of two of uh, ninety seven. Uh, it was basically after a long uh, kind of battle to. Um, see if we could salvage the band because basically, um, you know, heroin had infected our band and there wasn't, we weren't functioning anywhere. We could barely play live. We definitely couldn't write songs or record. And, you know, it was basically like trying to figure out if we were going to do interventions and, and all that kind of stuff, Mm. that kind of like life and death drama basically took over the band. And, you know, they're just, you know, the label, we, we made some inroads on that last record, Fantastic Planet, you know, uh, sold almost a hundred thousand and the label was asking for another album. And I just told them, this, we, we're not functioning. We cannot, I try, I even try, you know, I tried several times to get the band into the studio to write to see if we could come up with new material and just the, people weren't showing up and it was just not happening. So broke the band up, st- uh, thought about, you know, uh, you know, what should I do? Eventually I'd started writing some songs on my own. Um, and then basically from 97 until, um, uh, we reformed in 2014. Um, I stumbled through maybe three other projects as an artist. I tried uh, my on project, which is more of a electro pop kind of thing. Then I did another rock band called year of the rabbit. And then I even did a just straight Ken Andrews solo record. Um, but all of that was done during a period where I was really a l- kind of more focused on growing my career as a producer and a mixer. Because I started figuring out that that was my, uh, as Joseph Campbell says, that's where my bliss was, you know, was being in the studio. Um, I like playing live. I like playing the shows. I'm not a huge fan of touring in general, of traveling like that all the time. Um, And maybe just as a personality, I don't know if I feed off of that relationship with the audience the way I do. I know some of my friends do. Sure. Um, I think that, sorry to interrupt when you, to feed off that. And I don't say this in a negative way. I think you have to be pretty ego driven and I don't mean like you have to be an ego maniac, but I think mm-hmm. that, the people that thrive in that situation the best are ego driven and it like the getting, you know, like the proverbial Facebook likes or, you know, getting likes is a big driver. And again, I don't mean that in a negative way. There's nothing wrong with it, but I, but you have mm-hmm. to, if, if you're not that person, it's, it's, it's the, it's really tough to become that person. It is. It, it, it It's kind of innate or it's, you know, it's either in you or it isn't. And I agree. I've often, I've often thought that was kind of one of the reasons that, or maybe possibly one of the reasons why why failure never really took off huge. Because a lot of people said we had the music, we had the the songs, and and you know, well, why isn't it happening? Well, you know, a lot maybe there was no real quote unquote star in the band. What, and what is that? Well, that's a person who really likes it when the spotlight is on them. Then there's a template for every, whether it's in music or business or anything, there's a template to get 
rock star status. And part of mm-hmm. that template means you're fucking visible all the time. You, you yeah. know, you're on it all the time and you're living it 24 seven. And mm-hmm. if it, if that, like you, like I just said, and if, if you agreed, if that's not you, you, you can't, it's, it, it, you're not going to get rock star and you're ultimately going to be pretty miserable trying. Yeah. I think that's a fair, fair assessment, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but you know, so, so for me being, doing the music stuff uh, for, within the context of a band, it's kind of like, well, my favorite part of the the cycle, as it were, right, the album cycle, it is when we're in the studio. Sure. Whereas I can see for other artists, it's like, well, being in the studio is kind of like a means to the a means to an end. Yeah. Let I want to get back on stage. You know, that's where I want to be. I want right. to be on stage. And you know, I again, I like performing. I like. I do like the connection with our fans and, and it, you know, it's cool. It, you want to be appreciated. It's just the level to, to which that, um, you know, uh, completes your life, I guess maybe it, it yeah, that's an extrinsic kind of factor that, that either drives you or doesn't. And if it, mm-hmm. when, you know, if it doesn't, that's it, man. It's like, I, I totally get it. Man. Yeah. And so, you have this for me i'm i'm always slightly conflicted in the in being in a band and going through the band cycle because to me the the peak is w- when you're actually composing and yeah. recording the material sure and then the rest of it on a certain level is really the promo cycle sure right well now it's the delivery make- mechanism of the good stuff that you thrive on yeah yeah it's like you have to execute that to get that other to like almost manifest that other stuff to completion but yeah yeah you kind of have to go out there and sell your wares yeah to a certain extent so you can get to go into the studio next year yeah um so yeah i mean there's that so then you know so i but i over the years i'm starting to find out you know well if the studio is my favorite thing then why don't i just do that yeah and the way to do that from my point of view is or or it just kind of happens is that i get hired by other artists to work on their material and to me it's pretty cool it's it's not the same as working on your own material obviously but it's still i guess what it comes down to is kind of like what percentage of your day do you get to be creative sure you know and are you really being the, how creative are you being when you're on the road? You know, you, you're, you're, you're imagining how to put on a better show, the order of the songs you're going to play, um, the, the production lighting, all that stuff. It's not quite the same as actually, you know, working on a song in the studio that, you know, people are going to listen to. Sure. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, that's that's interesting. What so 19 years goes by everybody gets sober. And yeah, but yeah. Yeah, basically, yeah. So we we got sober. Um took a long time. There was lots of misfires and restarts. But eventually, uh yeah, we all got sober and we started having kids. And that's what really, I think, before we had children, Greg and I were starting to have more more and more contact. But then we had kids, and I think within six months of each other, our first kids. And um, <laughs> That's funny. <yeah. laughs> it's funny that you both had kids at the same – because my kids are grown, man. But I've been – I know what that overwhelm, that sheer fucking overwhelm of having kids is like. It's like – there's no manual that could have ever prepared you. For yeah. That. At least I terrifying. felt that way. Yeah. It's just like, yeah, very much. And so, you know, if you ha- have an old friend who's going through the same thing, all of a sudden you're like bonding on that. Right. Yeah. And T- helping yeah. kind of like, oh, so you're facing that too. <laughs> okay, cool. <laughs> yeah. And, and so, yeah, it, 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 that was definitely a huge factor in Greg and I kind of just, 
on a basic level of just rekindling our friendship. Huh. And we started hanging out more and talking more. And then people around us noticed that was happening. And s- sort of the, the suggestion that started coming out, well, have you guys thought about reforming the band? And we were like, no, no, we don't want to do that. Uh, I can't do that. And of course, you know, people kept kind of pushing and saying, well, you should think about it because there's a real audience out there that you probably don't even know about. But right. you and we were like, uh, the band broke up in '97. We sold like a hundred thousand records. We we're never that big. What are you talking about? And they're like, no, no. The people have got have discovered the band well after the breakup. There's people. There's that you have a fan base that you don't know about, and you know, that stuck in our heads. And we we're like, oh, what does that mean? And you know, we. It sort of coincided with us just literally like on weekends where we were getting the kids together, kind of like stumbling into the studio you know, and playing guitar together and just kind of messing around. And then all of a sudden, you know, it was like, well, wow, this is kind of fun to play together again. Like, do you really think there's like an interest in the, in, in the band? And well, there's only really one way to find out, and that's to book a show. And so we called up some of our old friends uh, in the business and said, "Hey, could we just book one show and just see what happens?" Um, and so we booked a show at the El Rey Theater in, on Wilshire here in, in L.A., and it sold out in like a minute. Wow! And yeah. That- what, what so when that happened? What did you guys like, or you? What did you? What did, how did that feel? We freaked out. We we freaked out. We we're like, oh, well, first of all, I thought it was going to be a little bit more of a casual affair, and we would just, you know, play some old songs and not be too concerned about, you know, too concerned about. It. It'd be kind of just a one-off. But then when it sold out that fast, we just realized there was a real appetite for it. We saw a lot of, some bloggers wrote about why this is an important thing for failure to be getting back together. And there was, oh, wow, it's kind of all this pressure. <laughs> now the pressure's on. <laughs> now the pressure's on. Yeah. So. Can't win, man. <laughs> yeah. But it was, no, it was cool. It was, it was very gratifying on, on, a, on a big level. But now we have to actually do the work. Yeah. And put together a good show and learned it, how to play everything again. And but so we played that first show, and it was just a that was a very eye opening experience because in the room we could really see that a good half of the crowd were in their 20s. So they had to be um, brand new fans that just had discovered your music. That was really cool, actually. Yeah. That, that 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 was the deciding point for me to actually want to get the band together because I didn't really I mean obviously you know for the for for fans of ours that saw us in the 90s they're like our age you know yeah. we were all young in our 20s in in the 90s so that was that's cool but I didn't want to base a whole comeback off of playing to those people. Greatest hits. Oh, oh, yeah. Greatest hits. And just, you know, that whole thing. So when I saw that there were younger kids that were really interested, in fact, the, the younger kids were the ones who were up front and the older people like me, when I go to shows, were in the <laughs> back, right. <laughs> you know, just observing, but enjoying. Um, so, I was like, wow, this is a cool thing. It, it's like we could be, maybe we're being given a second chance here to be a real band again and not just a, you know, a, a reunion thing. Um, so we did a tour. We did a, decided to book a whole tour and we did that. And that's where we really saw that the, the fan base was way younger than we thought it was going to be. Says okay, so in the middle of that tour, we basically agreed, let's make a new record. Let's make a and and try to be like a viable band making new music, as opposed to 
you know, a reunion type thing. Yeah. And yeah, that's, that's what started it all basically. And it, now here we are on our second, second album since the rebooting. And, um, you know, it, it doesn't feel like we're a new young band, obviously, cause we're not, but, um, at the same time, at least from a creative standpoint, I feel like we're pushing ourselves and, you know, trying to, we're, you know, we're putting effort into making cool stuff again. That's cool, man. Good story. Thank you for sharing that. Man. Um, Casino Royale. How'd you get involved with that theme song? What a just tremendous song as are so yeah. many great James Bond, you know, there's a small handful of just stellar. That's a weird one because I kind of came in. It, I'm miscredited on that all the time. What I really did on that was at the time I was friends with the head of music for Sony pictures. Okay. This woman named Leah Volick and she, I just done a, a, a song for another mo movie that she was <laughs> uh, in charge of the music on, which was Surf's Up. Mm -hmm. Do you know that? Do you remember that animated feature? No, I don't. Uh, there's like 10, there's like probably 10 years between us, maybe a little more. And so the stuff mm -hmm. that like my kids are even watching, I don't even get anymore. So <laughs> I'm, I'm removed from like a lot of what's going on out there. Well, there was a lot of, it, it, it's a movie about, it's an animated feature about uh, penguins. And there was a bunch of penguins things happening at the same time, like happy feet. You might right. Have heard that, of that one. Yeah, that one I, I saw actually. Yeah. Okay. So, so there's, so there was another one at the same time called surf's up by Sony, their new animation division. So they were putting a lot into it. They licensed a lot of Green Day music for that movie, but they needed some songs for some different scenes. And she asked me if I wanted to do a song for the scene and I did it. And uh, apparently the filmmakers were blown away and I, they had no changes to it. And it went in the movie sort of as is. And so she was feeling good about me at the time. And this problem came up with this Chris Cornell, James Bond song where people weren't happy with his, he wasn't happy with his vocal performance and nobody was happy with the mix, but the song had been recorded and it was a massive session. It was like hundreds of tracks because they had, it had like the normal rock band tracks in there. And then you have the orchestral stuff as well. So all of a sudden I get a call from Leah. She's saying, Hey, how would you feel about working on this Chris Cornell song? We're having problems with it. It's like, okay, sure. Yeah. I'll, I'll give it a swipe. And literally that afternoon, Chris Cornell, Chris Cornell comes over to our limo shows up in front of my house. <laughs> Chris Cornell gets out. <laughs> he walks into my studio and he's like, Hey, let's bang this out. And so, <laughs> I'd actually just finished uh, renovating my studio and I'd put in a new vocal booth and he was the first person to use it. Oh, that's cool. Um, and he sang, he sang, you know, he did a few more takes. Uh, we got it to a place where he was happy with it and I was happy with it. And I think that some of the timing on the orchestral stuff was kind of throwing them off on his original take. So the timing just seemed a little wonky on his performance, but we, we got it down. I made a new mix of it and that's what went into the movie. So really, I really only had like a day, a long day interaction with Chris yeah. on that. He did end up hiring me uh, a few months later when the movie came out and the tonight show had him wanted him to perform the song um to promote the movie and so uh he kind of threw a band together really quick and i ended up playing guitar and singing backup vocals on oh, that's cool on the tonight show with him yeah that's really cool but i i never i never really got to know him that well you know we just kind of hung out for a few days hmm. 
Very cool. Great, great song. They did a good job on that. Um, where where did you originally grow up? Seattle. Yep, born and raised in Seattle. Bought my first records at Peaches Records and Tapes uh, in the University District there, University of Washington District in uh, in Seattle. Um, you know, it was back. That was the '80s, so it was all vinyl. Yeah. And uh, Peaches was national, I think, too, right? Because uh, we had, unless it was a different Peaches, we had Peaches. I was living in South Florida at the time. We had Peaches there. Okay. Okay. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um. Yeah. I just remember, I would go to Peaches. My because my dad got really into classical music in my childhood because, you know, I mean, when I was, I think when I was like eight, we bought our first hi fi like stereo yeah, and we bought headphones and I remember l- plugging in those headphones and listening to music on the headphones and experiencing stereo for the first time. And just, I wouldn't take my headphones off. Oh, I yeah. had those headphones off. I would just lay there for hours and hours listening to records. Uh, some of the early heart records I was super into. I, I had that awesome um, Elton John's greatest hits that had come out dur- during that time. That was a big deal uh, for me. Um, Boston. Um, some of the harder stuff would have been Scorpions. Uh, some ACDC, some Van Halen. And then I started getting into New Wave. And probably my favorite new wave band, I, I guess if they were considered a new wave band, would have been the Cars. Oh, yeah. Especially Great like um, the first three records. Pretty much cut my teeth learning how to play guitar on those records. Those are great records, the, man. Those, those, well, the, the, those, those records are really good for learning how to play guitar because they're bone simple. The rhythm guitar. The parts that I'm guessing Rick Ocasek played, the, the songwriter, um, you know, you could learn those. If you could play a few bar chords, you could play those songs. And so that was a big deal for me because it was, I eventually learned how to play the whole album, hmm. you know, and so I could put or I could play a whole slide in a row. And, you know, that that's kind of how I learned how to play guitar. What was uh, your childhood like growing up in general? Um, you know, middle class. My my dad was a cop and my mom was a typist at the university. Um, you know, I will just I, all I all I know is that one of the things I was really into when I was a kid was riding my bike. And back then, when you were ten and and you were just kind of living in a neighborhood in Seattle. Man, my parents had no idea where I was. I would be <laughs> ten. I would be ten miles away from home all the time, <laughs> hanging out with a, a rough group of teenagers. You know, <laughs> um, and with my kids now, I would never let them do that. Yeah, it's different <laughs> kind of world funny. now. Yeah, it's a different world. Yeah, totally different, man. Mm. So I I liked my I mean I I really enjoyed my um my childhood in Seattle uh and then my parents split up when I was eleven and my mom ended up um in San Diego with her new husband and I I ended up moving to San Diego a few years after that and I ended up going to high school in San Diego so it's basically like thirteen through eighteen in San Diego. And that was coming from Seattle to move to San Diego was pretty awesome as a kid. I was going to say, you live uh, in pretty cool places. Well, I mean, Seattle is just so, I mean, we would just ride our bikes in the rain because it rained all the time in Seattle. Right. So if you wanted to be outside, you were getting wet. Um, I moved to San Diego and everyone's like in shorts and t-shirts year round. And it was just like, like I said, it, well, I was really into bikes, but then I got the last two years I was in Seattle and then pretty much until I was 16 down in San Diego, I got really, it was about five years of, of being involved in BMX racing. 
super into that. And I just got my my ten year old son into that here in Los Angeles, and he's he's about to turn intermediate actually. Oh, that's cool. Um, I yeah. So that was a cool sport. And again, in Southern California, it's kind of a great thing because you can do it year round. Sure. Um. So yeah, that was my childhood. Was a lot of bicycles and. Only at the very end, right before I went to college, my younger brother of two years, who had been playing guitar since he was 12, I think, he got really good. He, he could play very fast, and he could play uh, classical nylon finger-picked um, stuff, but also could shred metal-type stuff. Uh one day I was just coming home from from high school and I was just listening to him play and I walked into his room and I was like, dude, teach me a couple chords. And he's like, really? You've never shown any interest before. And I was like, yeah, just show me a couple chords. And that, that was it. He was basically my teacher for about maybe two or three months. And then I kind of used records to teach myself uh, beyond that. And um, yeah, that's how I came into music does is he involved in music now no i mean he is as a hobby but he ne never you know when it's went into it like i did which yeah. which was always we we joke about it now because he, he's the better musician <laughs> <That's> <laughs> technically funny. speaking yeah sure, um, sure. but yeah so we yeah we we talk about pedals and guitars and stuff all the time but, that's cool man that is cool yeah hey let's talk about gear for a few minutes um, mm -hmm. like what's your go-to guitar now? What other two would round out your top three? Well, my go-to guitar now is my own, uh, signature guitar, guitar that I have with, uh, electrical guitar company. Um, that, that company that makes all aluminum metal guitars. Man, I've never, do you, is it handy there? I'd love to see that if you have it handy. Um, and if you don't, that's cool. I've never. I'd yeah, like to see it's that. not super handy, but like if you go to their website, it's it's right there. Just Electrical Even Guitar Company. That's, electrical Guitar Company. That's wild. They make they make metal like aluminum body and and aluminum necks. Everything is is, is metal. Uh, they do make some acrylic bodies too, so like clear acrylic ones. Sure. Um. Uh. I. That guy actually, the guy uh, who owns the company, Kevin Burkett, came out to a failure show a few a couple of years ago and kind of introduced himself. I knew about the guitars already, and I was really interested. And he was like, "Well, let's let's you know." He, he gave me one that night, and I fell in love with it. Uh, and then he said later, he came to me and said, "Why don't we, you know, do something that that you can build yourself?" Uh, from the ground up. And so I have a 67 jazz master. That's a, been a big part of the whole failure thing for, for a while now. Um, and I, I really like that body shape. It's very comfortable on my body to play it both seated and standing. Um, so that's the body shape of my EGC uh, mm -hmm. model. Um, I like everything very dark and black. So the whole thing is black. A lot of their, um, I don't think they had ever done, um, a black anodized neck where the whole neck was black. I didn't want a chrome, a chrome neck. So, um, they, they did that for me. So the whole guitar, a lot of their metal guitars are, partially chrome like they look sh like shiny metal basically um but i wanted something that was all anodized black and so they did that and i also was really i've always wanted a guitar that had an electric guitar that had a um a piezo pickup or a piezo yeah pickup in it so you can get acoustic type sounds because <laughs> mm -hmm. we have a lot of in, in failure we have a lot of uh, songs that ha have acoustic uh, moments in them 
and then it goes right to a you know big kind of crunchy sound electric sound and i've always we've never been able to do that live it's always been a compromise to have just a clean a yeah. clean sound basically um and even then we're usually on a humbucker guitar to do the crunch stuff properly so the clean is not even that clean and it's a little bit of an issue so I was really interested to try it and he's and Kevin said you know what I'm actually really I've been wanting to try out one of these uh graph tech piezo systems I think it's called the ghost or something like that so he put one of those in uh, brought the guitar out to another tour date, and basically I've developed this um, system now with this guitar where I can, it essentially has two outputs, uh, one for the magnetic, you know, normal pickups in the guitar, and then one, uh, uh, an output that is just the um, piezo pickup. And I send it, those to two separate wireless transmitters, that go to two separate inputs on my fractal axe effects. Okay. So, and then I have a pedal board that controls the axe effects, um, a pedal switcher made by RJM Technologies. Um, and so essentially what I have now is kind of, to me, kind of the holy grail of, of sound switching for live, which is, Without even touching the guitar, I can uh, foot switch between a incredibly, you know, clean, glassy, shimmery acoustic sound to a you know full stack Marshall sound, basically <laughs> That's in, pretty cool. in, in one switch. It's kind of a lot going on there, really. Um, uh, it's actually you know looking at, at two different outputs of the guitar looking at two different inputs of the fractal um but it, it, it's a really cool thing it, and used it i think we've have that kind of set up in like maybe four or five songs now for for live so and i just really like the guitar i like it's obviously the only downside is it's about a pound heavier than, than a uh, uh similar wood yeah guitar uh, but the, there's there's a lot of advantages to the metal. One is you don't have to have a tapered neck, right? It does the neck doesn't get fatter as it mm -hmm. moves more towards the body. It's it's the exact same the whole way because the metal is so much stronger, right? Yeah, uh, okay. Uh, so when you're playing up high, it's so much easier to get to those notes. That's interesting. Yeah, okay. And the cut and the way he's made the cutaway down there, you can really get to the high notes a lot easier. Which for us, we do have quite a few mo melodies that are, you know, above the twelfth fret. Hmm. Um, and the other thing that the metal does is that everything is just much more precise in terms of the angles and the um, geometry, basically, of the guitar. Um, so, uh, just lost my train of thought real quick. The, geom on, the metal, back. the metal is more precise with the geometry. Yeah. The, the metal is more. So what happens is the intonation on the guitar is awesome. It's spot on I mean, all the really, time. It's spot on up and down the neck. So yeah. if you play an F major bar chord at the bar bottom of the neck and then go up to the 12th fret and play it. There are very few wood guitars sound perfectly intonated yeah. in both of those positions, but on these guitars, they do. And it's, it's just, it's awesome. Basically. Um, you know, cause we do a lot of dissonant chord voicings and when those aren't intonated properly, they really, 
don't sound good. Hmm. I mean, yeah. dissonance has to be in tune, if that makes sense. Well, yeah, if it just be, yeah, just because it's a dissonant chord, it, it doesn't mean it's out of tune. It may, it may right. actually, it may be not dissonant if it's out of tune. <laughs> yeah, if it's far enough out of tune. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, the dissonance of it has to be kind of precise. Yeah. And in, in order to be beautiful, mm -hmm. otherwise it just gets ugly really fast yeah. and sounds out of tune. So, um, yeah, I did. And so for, for a lot of these chords that are, a lot of these songs have chords up high and down low and they have, you know, some notes that are kind of dissonant. It's, it's really nice to have a guitar that's very balanced intonation wise. Um, the, so I guess it would be the weight would be the only negative and maybe there's an, there's one other thing negative that that i found which is it's pretty subtle most of the time but it's it's sort of counterintuitive if you've been playing wood guitars your whole life like i have which is wood guitars when you first start playing them and they're all and they're in tune but by the end of the song or maybe two songs they tend to go flat because they're getting warm your hands are warming up the strings. The wood, I guess, is not moving around that much. It's not changing its shape too much mm -hmm. as you're as you're playing. So, but the point is, generally, you're you're used to the strings going flat. So, if you're going to make a correction mid song or in between songs, you're almost always going up which is easy. It's always easier to go up and pitch. I find when you're correctively tuning a guitar. Sure. With the EGCs, because they're metal. And I think this is what I've actually never talked to Kevin about this, but I've been noticing they tend to go sharp. So you have to tune down a little bit. So you have to tune down, which is slightly yeah, harder. It's, yeah, it is a little harder to tune down than to tune up. I don't know why. Yeah, it, yeah, because you, it's, you you always overshoot it. Maybe just a tiny you, bit. Well, it pops out of its position, yeah. and then you got to climb it back up, right? As opposed to just tweak, you know, e tweaking it up yeah. a hair. Yeah. Um. So, but I guess what's happening is that the body is warming up, or the neck is warming up. And because it's metal, it's expanding, and it's actually stretching the strings. Hmm. But it's very consistent. It, it you get a metal guitar if it's not already completely acclimated to your hand temperature, um, it will it tends to go sharp first. But then once it's acclimated, man, it's just, it just stays. It stays in tune the whole show. It stays in tune the whole show, which is just so. You know, when you're playing uh live at least for me like tuning and and being in tune is like a major source of anxiety <laughs> you know cause i i i hear it maybe you, more yeah you well do. you've obviously got you, i mean if you're in the studio and if that's one of your as you said fun, if that's one of your blisses and obviously you're good at it you're going to be more hypersensitive to that than you know the average person probably would be yeah I can see that. I'm kind of tortured by it. I hate it. I really, <laughs> I hate when we're a little bit out of the tune and I've been known to even st stop in the middle of the show and just be like, let's start over. Wait, are you, are you OCD on top I'm of that? Yeah. Oh fuck. This, <laughs> At least for tuning. This could be, for you, tuning. you could be there for hours <laughs> working with this thing here. <laughs> I just don't want to do a whole song with like a really chimey arpeggiated guitar that's played up high and the third note is super sharp yeah. you know i don't want to play the whole five minute song hearing that note being sharp every yeah. time i can't handle it it's just like what's the point let's just stop fix it and start <laughs> over <laughs> oh, i know it's a pro it's a problem so i'm all i I, hey, if that's your biggest enough. cross to bear at this point in time, life ain't too bad, right? Yeah. yeah. Right? That's how you got to look at it, right? I'm experimenting a lot with different string gauges, different types of strings, always looking to, you know, keep the guitars in tune live 
as much as possible. Hmm. Um, so right now we're going to on the because we tuned to E flat. Okay. Yeah. Across the board. Uh, so for me, fifty two is or or tens is not. They're not not enough tension. To, to stay, it's too much flapping around. So you, what are you playing? Elevens, uh, twelves. Elevens to fifty four. Okay. Because there's a few songs where we got to drop that E flat down to D flat. Oh wow! And then you got to you at least have to have fifty four. I'm, I'm I'm debating whether to dedicate the drop D songs to their own instruments and put a fifty six. Good lord, that'd the, be a lot easier for you. Yeah, but it means taking extra instruments, which is a whole other, you know, then you're dealing with a lot more work for the tax, more weight on the truck, and, you know. Hey, that's what do they call it? That's a first world problem. Yeah, right. <laughs> we got to take more instruments. <laughs> yeah. Hey, man, Desert Island Discs, top three. No particular order and just for today, because that's impossible. Well... I don't know. I'm going to go with some really old stuff from my childhood because I've been playing that stuff for my kids lately and they've just been lapping it up. And they're, it's funny because their greatest hits things. Um, Wings greatest hits. Great record, man. Um, I mean, I think they have like three or four greatest hits now, but the one, I guess it would have been the first one. Um, you know, band on the run and just like, I don't know that, that, that album is just insane how good it is. Um, that was a and great, then that, that John band. greatest hits, that first one, uh, <laughs> timeless, absolutely timeless. Um, and then, uh, Led Zeppelin three remastered has been making a big uh making its presence known in my house can i tell you something everybody picks the stuff that they grew up with i have yet to i have 420 something interviews and that's pretty i ask that question all the time because it's just interesting i don't know you know maybe someone will pick one contemporary record but 95 98 percent of the time it's stuff they grew up with it's quite funny i mean you know a, a contemporary record that i'm listening to right now that i love and i really I, I really like this band and i really respect them a whole different generation than me is the um the 21 pilots uh band and their new record uh trench awesome album as was Check their last i mean they're doing so i mean they're, they're just they're huge now i mean they've got both, I think, I believe both their current record and their previous record are both in the top ten. That's pretty That's impressive. Unusual, yeah, 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 very unusual, man. Yeah, talented hey, kids. I'm gonna ask you three questions, and I appreciate all your time. Tell me something about yourself people would either be surprised to hear or might find a little odd. Uh, I like to fold laundry. Oh, dude. <laughs> that is a lot. <laughs> that's the that's my favorite chore. I don't know why. Really? I find it to be very meditative for some reason. Watching the news and folding laundry. Love it. Interesting, man. Yeah. I'm trying to think. I don't yeah. I don't mind folding laundry. I can't can't say I like it or it. Yeah, I don't like unloading the dishwasher. That's my worst one. Unloading and putting the dishes away? Yes. Yeah. Okay. I'll load it. Loading it's fine. Even getting all the dirty food off first, that's fine. Unloading and putting away. Ugh. See, I'm funny. I lo I'd rather unload just because I bang this shit out real quick. Yeah. Uh, hmm. I have a full, clean dishwasher staring at me right now. <laughs> <laughs> um. You have any hobbies or interests? Outside of music, besides laundry and BMX, uh, not really. I mean, well, no photography. Um, not necessarily videography, but photography. Um, what kind of? I'm a huge. What do you like to I, do? I, 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 you, you know, the. I mean, 
that when the Canon 5D Mark II came out, which was like a big, big kind of deal in the filmmaking world because it actually shot beautiful video. It was the first DSLR. I actually hadn't owned a good camera since I had been in college. And then when that came out, it came out when my son turned one, I think, or two. And I was like, oh, God, I got to have this thing. And I splurged and bought it. And it basically started an avalanche of <laughs> photography issues for me, <laughs> uh, buying a lot of a lot of gear, a lot of lenses. I got really into collecting um, vintage Leica lenses from oh, yeah. the God, 70s and those are early 80s. Those pricey as shit. My yeah. God, yeah. I have a whole set. The thing about those still lenses is that they're really good for filmmakers uh, because they have manual focus. They're all metal and they look great. And they don't have all the modern coatings that they put on lenses now to stop flare hmm. and to stop, you know, uh, aberrations from happening, basically. But now people are, want all that stuff in their in their pictures. They want to, to see the, the lens, you know, have an effect on the image. And so I've actually put together this really cool com com complete set of uh, like a primes from 19 millimeter to 200 millimeter and i rent those to filmmakers here in hollywood all oh the that's time. cool man yeah you said aren't all, like as only manual except for the very recent i thought they were only manual lenses i didn't realize they had any kind of automatic focus i don't know anything about leica from 91 on okay yeah, I think All they're I only know. been manual. Yeah, I, I, it's probably true. Yeah, it's probably true. Yeah. They're all the ones that I have. The, the the thing that's different about them from modern still lenses is that they're all metal. There's no plastic. There's no autofocus. They're like cinema primes in a way. That's cool, man. Good little side gig there. Yeah. And Ken, last question. I really appreciate your time. What's been the biggest change in your personality? over the last 10 years and how much of that change has been deliberate and intentional and how much has just been maybe a part of aging? Uh, I think it's probably all the, you know, kind of standard things, you know, maybe a little less angry, uh, a little more appreciative and hopefully a little wiser. And I, I, I don't think I've purposely tried to do any of it. I think it's just happened from age. Sure, man. How many kids you got? Two. Ten and seven. Oh, Boy you're, in the, girl. you're in the thick of it, man. It's... I'm in the thick of it. There's so many activities right now. It's out of control. Yeah, I know. Man. <laughs> Remember those days. Well, man, um, I really appreciate your time. Um, thank you very much for everything. And I want to tell people to please check out in the future your body will be the furthest thing from your mind because it probably will mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh support phil are you guys gonna do a tour oh yeah you said you mentioned it's coming up so. we're talking yeah, about right. a spring tour it'll probably be announced uh in the next few weeks Awesome. Awesome. Well, check out failure and um, check out the new record. Check out all the old failure stuff. Again, in the future, your body will be the furthest in your mind. Any final words of wisdom, man? Follow your bliss. Follow your bliss, Joseph Campbell. There you go. Thank you, man. Yeah. I, I appreciate it. Everybody, okay. thank you so much for listening. If you enjoyed this interview, please share it with a friend in your social media channels. We appreciate your support. Thanks so much to Ken Andrews for spending time with us. Support Ken's music and check out Failure, please. Make sure you get to everyonelovesguitar.com. Sign up to get on our newsletter list so you and I can connect. And most important, remember that happiness is a choice, so choose wisely. Be nice, go play your guitar, and have fun. Till next time, peace and love, everybody. I'm out. We hope you enjoyed this show. If you did, subscribe to the Everyone Loves Guitar podcast, and you can do this online at everyonelovesguitar.com or on iTunes. And if you like the show, please leave us a five-star positive review. The more five-star reviews we get, the higher our show ranks, and higher rankings mean we get to continue speaking with cool, interesting guests on our show. 
We'll see you on the next episode. And until then, keep playing your guitar and have fun making music. Thank you.